Hello, hello, and welcome again to A Beatles Show, a podcast that we call Things We Said Today. This is a talk show in which we talk about anything concerning the Beatles, anything about their past, their history, or possibly things going on in the news today. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the four regular co-hosts of the show, and you might know me from my other syndicated Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing, being joined by two of my other regular co-hosts. One of which is the writer for Beatles Examiner, that being Steve Marinucci. Hello, Steve. Hi, Ken, and hello, everyone. And we also have with us one of the writers for Beatle Fan Magazine and a freelance writer and author of the recent ebook. Um, got that something. <laughs> got that something. <laughs> So what's the rest of the title, Alan? Got that something, how the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand changed everything. Okay, Alan Cozen is here to join us. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, Steve. Hello, everyone. And unfortunately, one of our regular co-hosts, that being Al Sussman, writer for Beatle Fan Magazine, couldn't be with us. He's in the middle of or finishing up his move to Pittsburgh. So uh, we wish him well in his new abode mm -hmm. and uh he will be joining us on our next show all right so on the show this time we thought we'd talk about ringo and in particular i think uh we were we were discussing the possibility of uh, presenting an overview of his solo career and talk about in general what have been his great successes and also at the same time his failures what have been the wrong moves that ringo's made in a solo career, a combination of both. So uh, I thought maybe I'd start the conversation by bringing up the very beginning of the music that Ringo put out. And uh, back in 1970, he actually released two albums, uh, one of which was an album of standards, Sentimental Journey, and the other one was an album of country music. And then that was followed by two big hits for Ringo that were just released as singles, A Don't Come Easy and then Back Off Boogaloo, followed by what became his biggest selling album of all time, the Ringo album of 73. But I just wanted to start the conversation by asking the two of you whether you thought that starting his career with those two albums and not doing what you might expect Ringo to do, a pop rock album, was that an interesting choice? Were they strong moves? Was it, was it a wise move on Ringo's part to begin his solo career with those two albums? So why don't we start with Alan? Okay. Um, you know, I think it was an interesting choice. That's a good way to put it. I think commercially, it probably wasn't the best idea, or certainly Sentimental Journey wasn't. Um, I think at the time, 1970, mm, nobody in the sort of Beatles audience really wanted to hear that. I mean, the whole trend of rock stars doing the sort of great uh, you know, they call it the great American song because I guess they're mostly American, but probably not entirely American. Just looking over actually the writer credits for Sentimental Journey, it really is, I guess, mostly American, if not all. But, you know, um, there was not yet the trend towards towards recording that stuff. And uh, Ringo was sort of out on his own and it just seemed very, very eccentric. And also, um, as Ringo has put it, I'm not Pavarotti, you know, uh, yeah. he, nor is he Sinatra um, and certainly not Ella. The thing that's interesting, though, is that um, I think now um, a lot of us who pretty much ignored that album when it came out look back at it now and say, you know, wow, that's, that was an interesting move, an interesting choice of songs. You know, he had an all-star team of arrangers, which I think may have been lost on a lot of us who were, you know, teenagers at the time um, mm. and, and didn't care that much about the music or, you know. I, I think uh, I think actually people might enjoy it more now than they did then if they were to look back at it. And in a way, the same with Boo Coops of Blues. Um, you know, he got uh, an all-star cast of session players like Pete Drake on pedal steel, and and I think as a Ringo album goes, that is a little closer to what you might have expected. I mean, after a while, all he had sort of prepared us with Act Naturally uh, and things like that. I mean, we always sort of knew that he had this interest in country music. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so this wasn't that much of a leap. 
Um, and I thought at the time that, that that album was a bit more interesting than Sentimental Journey. And now uh, I think they're both OK. I mean, uh, I, I don't see I don't see masses of people sort of rediscovering them, but it, it might be nice if they did. Um, so, yeah, it was a surprising move. I think it was an audacious move, actually. Um, I don't think people necessarily think of Ringo as the audacious one. <laughs> but, um, you know, ultimately, uh, we saw Paul sort of catching up with him with Kisses on the Bottom. That's true. Many, many years later. Yeah. How about you, Steve? What did you think of uh, Ringo starting his solo career with those two albums? Well, first, I think you have to go back to you know, what he did with the Beatles and his, I mean, some of the stuff he did was decidedly eclectic. I mean, if you want to call it act naturally, I mean, act naturally is not the type of thing that you would have expected from, you know, the recorded, the, the general catalog of the Beatles, you know, so they Ringo kind of had, had made his own little niche um, with the Beatles. And then, you know, when he, when he started with Sentimental Journey, I mean, that was kind of, he was also kind of following what the other guys were doing with their own little, you know, uh, vanity projects. And, you know, he, and he said at the time that, you know, that was the type of music his mother liked. And, and yeah, it was, uh, the first thing I thought of was, yeah, Paul followed his lead, you know, uh, all those years later uh, with, with Kisses. But, uh, yeah, I, I agree, Alan. I, you know, this is not an album that people pay a, a lot of attention to. Sentimental Journey, maybe people will now, you know. But I mean, he's not he's not doing any songs from it. But that would be interesting if he pulled out one of those songs during for the All Star Band. But that mm -hmm. won't happen. Um, yeah. It'd be it'd be more likely he would pull out a, a Boku a blues song. But even then, you know, both of these are are, are real niche albums that yeah, just kind of uh were under the radar i think at the time i don't think anybody really paid that much attention to him you know like some of the other vanity projects the beatles did you know so i i it's interesting if he had done if he had gone with something a little more commercial at the time what would have happened you know why he waited until 73 well we can probably guess why he waited until 73 because he probably wasn't in, in much shape to do anything at that point you know but um, was he in better shape yeah. in '73? <laughs> Good question. Uh, yeah, probably not. You know, probably not. Um, but what, what did what did that comment mean? <laughs> Which minor Steve's? <laughs> <laughs> Yours, Alan. Well, I'm assuming that Steve means that he was still in uh, what uh, in PDQ box life was called the South period. Um, there we go. Yeah, um, but that lasted until 1989, so I'm not sure whether in 1973 he was better or worse off than he was in 1970, you know. You know, another interesting thing is that he seems not to have counted those two albums. I mean, if you if you just go by the, the one clue he gives, which is the title of Ringo the Fourth, that's the fourth of his albums starting with Ringo, Ringo Goodnight V. Right, right. So, reviewer Ringo the Fourth. It's, it's as it will wait, it really is Ringo the Sixth, isn't it? I mean... Mm -hmm. So he seems not to have counted those two himself, and I'm curious why, really. Yeah, that is, yeah. That is weird. That is weird. I never realized that, actually. That's, he, uh... he often refers to the Ringo album as though it's his first. Mm -hmm. So, hmm. But I definitely think that uh, there were interesting choices that he made. I don't think that he was consciously trying to uh, to make a statement so much with these albums saying this is the direction the direction I'm going to be going in and um you know like we said sentimental journey was an album that he made to please his parents mm -hmm. but at the same time if you follow the whole beatles history they were so influenced by everything mm -hmm. they loved that kind of music anyway and it was a part of them whether they did it as a band or not you know even if you watch magical mystery tour and they're singing uh, when the red red robin goes bob right. bob bobbing along. That's part of who they were. That's part of what they grew up on. It's, and, it's and, you know. And even George did Hoagie Car Carmichael. Um, right. John never went down that. I'm trying to think. Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. John never went down that road. It would have been interesting by now if it, to see if he would have had he still been around. But um, John really didn't, I know. didn't do that. Yeah, when Paul released Kisses on the Bottom, he was mentioning a couple of songs that he cited that John really liked from 
the 30s or, you know, very early on. He liked that kind of music. Mm -hmm. He just didn't want to give people that image that he did. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and actually, so, I, I, we had we've we've uh, a couple of us have mentioned that Act Naturally sort of fits in with Bukoops of Blues. But in a way, you could slot Good Night from the White Album onto Sentimental Journey and it would be perfectly at home. Good point. Absolutely. Good point. Excellent point. You know. And he also did the um oh, what was the the uh tribute the on the tribute to Harry Nilsson. That oh oh the oh god, I am trying to remember the name of the song. You're not talking about Lay Down Your Arms. No, no, no. Uh Stevie um, Nicks. Didn't he do uh When You Wish Upon a Star? Uh, or my, oh that uh, was my on that Disney tribute. That's um, right. Yeah. The Hal right. right. That's what I'm yeah, right. that's what I'm thinking about. So yeah, I mean the same, you know, it's the same, all the same. And in act actually, when you wish upon a star is a very cool track. That's a wonderful track, you know. It, it, I mean, his voice. It, it, the thing about Ringo's voice is that it's so. You, it, I, I guess the word you want to use is unique. You know, it's not. It's not your typical. I mean, everybody knows that Ringo is not Frank Sinatra, as we were saying earlier, but it opens up the possibility of doing some very interesting material, and he did it early on. That may have been, you know, those just may have been tests just to see, but he really could take some unusual songs, especially now, and have fun with them. I don't know that he will. It seems like he's, he's you know, he's rocking, and he's insisting on being a rock and roller now, and enjoying that a little more but uh, boy i mean he could do he, there are some interesting things he could do but ringo takes a lot of knocks for for uh not being considered a great singer and even he himself has said it you know he's not pavarotti mm -hmm. but by the same token for the music that he records his voice is suitable for all that and even for something like sentimental journey those songs those arrangements of them didn't require that much of a vocal range so for whatever it is that he's recording, his voice suits it very well. Well, he doesn't. And actually, he doesn't go out of his. I, he doesn't go out of his. Um, you know, he he sticks within. He knows his limits. Um, very, right. So, but I think that his voice works really well with those arrangements and that kind of music. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, sentimental journey. I think for the most part, I think it it was executed very well. It's just the public may not have been ready for that especially as the first album to come from Ringo. Mm -hmm. The same thing with an all-country album. And in a way, when the Beatles did Act Naturally, that wasn't that big of a shocker, I think. The Beatles have always been eclectic since the very beginning, and maybe as we were seeing their catalog unfold in front of us as it was happening, we may not have thought that as it was happening. But, you know, you, you listen to a lot of the music that preceded Act Naturally in the Beatles catalog. There's a lot of country and Western in their music. Mm -hmm especially on the Beatles for Sale album, for example. So, you know, actually it was certainly not a, a, a shocker to me that the Beatles would do something like that. And actually they didn't really expand, you know, they stuck with his, within his limitations pretty much actually from, from what he had done during uh, when he was with Rory Storm because he did, he did Boys then, correct? And he also, mm -hmm. did, didn't he do um, Act Naturally then? Or am I... Am I thinking wrong i know he did uh he i know he did boys because on that that album of um the rory storm album he, he, i think boys is on there but uh although he does he's, no. he's not on that that's right too but the the buck owens version of act naturally was a hit in 1963 so ringo had already left rory by then he that's was in right, the beatles right, so he couldn't right. have done the song then that's right that's mm -hmm. right Okay. But even a lot of the you know the the rockabilly the country and western stuff, what goes on to right. me is in the same vein. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not that far removed from Mac Naturally. Yeah. No. But um, a lot of people all these years later have looked back now at Buku's of Blues and they think that you know it was a really good album, a strong album, and wish that Ringo would continue doing more country music because. In part, it doesn't require as much of a vocal range, and his voice really suits country music very well. Mm -hmm. And I think that album really proves that. You know, it's it's. Um, I don't like every single song on it, but there are some really good songs in particular. It was produced extremely well. The musicianship was fantastic. And when you listen to the CD, even though going back now to uh, the 90s when that CD came out, it's bright and punchy, and it was produced really well. Yeah. So... Uh, 
I think they were two very good albums, but I think the public wasn't really prepared. I don't think they were prepared for a full Ringo album anyway. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, you know, it's funny, but Ringo's Ringo's voice, I mean, you say what you want about it. I mean, it really has a certain personality and charm that, you know, like I, like when we were talking about um, Dark Horse a, a couple of weeks ago, or was it even last week, you know, when I was talking about the sound George's music had was so typically – you know, his thumbprint and, you know, Ringo's voice is like that too. And, you know, there are a lot of worse voices out there, um, you know, attached to people who have huge careers. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know why Ringo takes some of the, the knocks that he does as a vocalist. I mean, he's, he's not a virtuoso vocalist. Okay. But he can put over a song, you know, not only that, but I think um, even though he doesn't try to stretch his vocals, live these days he knows what his limitations are and he works with them you go back to some of the live recordings with the beatles sometimes when he sings boys Mm -hmm. i mean his voice has a real edge to it Mm -hmm. um even in act naturally you're listening to the shea stadium performance and i love that little bit of edginess that roughness you know so his voice no it wasn't the greatest voice in rock and roll but within its limitations he has a, a good singing voice it's not a great singing voice it shouldn't really be cut down, yeah. I think. Mm-hmm. He has his own style, like you said, Al. That's what you can say about the Beatles, all four of them. They have their own individual vocal sound, mm-hmm. their own individual songwriting style. Yeah, they're just so unique, all four of them, mm-hmm. you know, in every aspect. But then we move on to It Don't Come Easy and Back Off Boogaloo, two huge hits. And actually, many people may not know this, but Back Off Boogaloo turned out to be the highest charting single for Ringo in the UK. Hmm. Whereas here in, in America, Photograph was a number one hit, as was Your 16. But um, those two singles, both produced by George Harrison, were huge hits here in the States. And It Don't Come Easy has certainly gone on to become a rock staple now. So moving on to those two singles, how do you look back at those now, guys? How about you, Alan? Those are great tracks. You know, they they just are. I mean, they're 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 Ringo in his element, and back off Boogaloo with that drum sound as well. Uh, you sort of get that yeah. side of Ringo too. And um, you know, and, I, and we should probably um, also mention early 1970 as a flip side of it. Don't come easy, I think, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know that that has a little bit of that autobiographical thing that he is now you know working to death on his last few <laughs> albums, but. Um, you know, and it's uh, it's interesting. You know, he's talking about the others, and it was a very tense period. You know, for all of them, and apparently including him, he was the one who got along with everybody. Right. But you know, he's. I, I think he. Uh, well, there was some some fisticuffs with Paul apparently um, over you know Ringo being the one sent to tell him that uh, he shouldn't put out his album at the same time as Let It Be, and that didn't go well. Um, so I think on his verse, he says, when he comes to town, I hope he's going to play with me. Right. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's this is sort of an interesting um, footnote. I had a copy of, or still have, of an EMI session sheet for a song called Three Nights in Moscow, which was always one of these titles that turned up on bootlegs and, you know, mm-hmm. no one knew mm-hmm. quite what it was. But it's clear from the session sheet that it's a Ringo song, although John is involved and George, and it's, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of ambiguity on this sheet. So I, one of the times I interviewed Ringo, I asked him, you know, what about that? Is that an early version of of early 1970 or or what and and he said uh you just read someone's book and i said no and i opened up my file and said i have the track sheet right here and he looked at it and he said you know i i just don't know what that is but it seems to me i mean it has to be early 1970 because it's you know three nights and four nights in moscow it it just seems like you know about four different people it just has to be. I can't imagine what else it is if it's not early 1970. Hmm. But anyway. I somehow can't, I can't see Ringo coming up with that title for a song about the other three Beatles and his relationships with them. Yeah, I know. You know it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. But, but I do think that there's very clever wordplay there yeah. in those lyrics. Like you were saying, that's just that one little change in the lyrics. Mm-hmm. 
And when he comes to town, I hope he's going to play with me, or I, you know, as opposed to I know he's going to play with me. Yeah. So you know, and some people may not have picked up on that. <laughs> did you? But it's it's really clever. Alan, did you say the dates the the dates of early 1970 and Three Nights in Moscow are this are pretty close? I think they were. Um, I I I should have uh, had the track sheet out, but. In fact, I don't even know where it is right now. But yeah. Um, yeah, they were pretty close. But there were some other, there were some anomalies that you know made it kind of still a mystery. So it's just one of those things that we've never completely got to the bottom of. But it, it sort of has to be that. You know, what else could it be? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Ringo didn't Interesting. know anyway. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, How about you, Steve? Those two songs. Uh, those are those are fantastic songs. I'm looking at my billboard book here and they they both were top 10 hits which he you know, yep. they weren't his his highest rank highest hits cause right because he, he also had two number ones but the fact that and they were top 10 hits um you know one in 71 one in 72 so that's you know that's pretty that's that's pretty good i mean it shows he was really King it off, but I mean those things are those two songs are great, and even better when the demo. It was even better when the demo of uh, "It Don't Come Easy" surfaced with uh, George. Uh, that was that was amazing. I I I love hearing that. Uh, yeah. um, you don't hear that very often um, on any of the Beatles shows, but it's a great song, right? Great version. Um, but I remember being really excited when it when that showed up when that uh, first uh, came out. But no, I love those two songs. Uh, I, I think I think I, it don't come easy is probably the better of the two songs, but they're both great. I mean, he mm-hmm. he, he does them really really well. So it's always kind of interesting when you look back. There's certain songs in every artist's career that stand out as though they become classics and staples, and they still get regular airplay. And for for Whatever the reason, it don't come easy is that song with Ringo as well as Photograph. But what is it specifically about it don't come easy? What is the appeal of that song? Do you think? Aside from the fact that I think it's a great song and I love the recording, I love the production behind it. You know, I love George's production and the and his guitar work in there. You know, what is it specifically about that song? Because it's obviously so important. Ringo does it in every show. You know, it must be a favorite of his. So can you pinpoint what you think is is so great about that particular song why that's a standout? I think hmm. it fits his I think it fits his voice better than than uh, Boogaloo. I'm not saying compared to Back Off Boogaloo. I mean I'm saying in in terms of his entire catalog. Well, I think it, it it's a song he can he sounds very good singing. Mm-hmm. I think that I think that's really the the bottom, you know, that I think that's probably one of the better reasons to you know that you can come up with that mm-hmm. uh it, he sounds his voice sounds a lot more comfortable singing that song than and he doesn't have to with back off boogaloo with the you know with the um the drums and everything and the and the the beat and everything it's it's he has to sing a little louder and he it it almost like he has to compete with the with the music whereas with it don't come easy he doesn't really have to compete with the music what do you th- what do you think alan yeah you may be right um i i never really thought of them as one versus the other i i i think he does pretty well in back off boogaloo too but i think it don't come easy is as you say sort of a better song as a song And um, I don't know, it's just um, that's a great combination of singer and song there. And uh, that's it just clicks. Mm -hmm. Mm. And I think and I think, too, since since that demo showed up that everybody, you know, most fans know about that demo and you hear that and you kind of you mean, I don't know if you hear hear that when you hear him sing it, but you're aware of it. And it and it's that much more, you know, it's that much more significant that George also did it, you know. I don't I, I don't recall hearing any real alternate versions of Back Off Boogaloo. I mean other than the live versions um that he's done, but I mean I don't think there are any outtakes of that floating around. No. Um not that I've heard. Right. But you know Ringo Ringo has admitted that George helped him write it. Mm-hmm. 
But uh, the way that Ringo explained it, I think Ringo said that he, Ringo, wrote two of the verses in the chorus and, and George finished the rest of the song. But probably what happened in the studio was that George was going through a run-through with the musicians. And instead of having Ringo sing it as he's drumming, George would do it. But an interesting thing about that demo is that you got all the, the Hare Krishna background vocals in there, which obviously Ringo didn't want to keep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, so maybe George is making a suggestion there. Obviously, that was, you know, his. That would be his suggestion for that song, and and Ringo didn't want it in there. But uh, yeah, it's a terrific overall, not only great song, which Ringo is so comfortable singing, but the whole arrangement of it. Like I said, the production, George, you know, it's it's debatable. Maybe we should do a show on this. But of the other Beatles, which one do you think did the best work for Ringo? Because they all knew how to how to write for Ringo really well, but uh, Ringo had more success with George with his work, especially writing photograph with him as well. So uh, yeah, don't come easy. Back up, Boogaloo. I do love that drum sound. Yeah, especially at the oh. very beginning, that thick drum sound. It's just so wonderful. I wish there was more more songs that had not just the drumming itself, but that sound. You don't really hear that really full, rich, thick drum sound on a lot of, uh, you know, Ringo's records. Especially, you know, I love the the production on his recent stuff. It's got a more high-end, bright, punchy sound to it. But whereas this one was, I don't know, just a very fat-sounding, thick-sounding drum sound, which, I you know, I I wish I heard more of it. I think if you're talking about Beatle contributions, you have... uh, uh, you have to also consider Lennon um, and I'm the Greatest. I remember mm-hmm. when the demos of, demos of that came out. Those were freaking awesome. Those were yeah. great. That's something else I haven't heard in a while, but remember those, you know, those those are unforgettable when Lennon is singing that. And actually, you almost think Lennon sounds more natural with that song. And maybe Lennon originally had planned to do that song and and you know on uh, a nice gesture on his part was to give it to Ringo but he sounds he sounds great doing that song he really does I think he wrote so, it for Ringo oh, yeah. I, I can't see him doing it I mean we hear the demos of course but I kind of think that if you know if 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 someone were able to ask him you know what did you intend to do that yourself you would have said hey I already had enough trouble saying I'm bigger than Jesus I'm not going to put out a record called I'm the greatest but right. Ringo oh, yeah. Ringo that's a, that's I think he, he would have felt that Ringo could do it you know because I don't know that's just my impression No I think I think and I think you're right I think you're absolutely right there about about you know that whole thing about about Jesus, but um, it's still he does sound really good singing that song, yeah. and and um, so that demo, that particular demo, also sounds really good. It's too bad there's not more. There there really isn't a lot of Ringo things floating around. I mean, there've been the uh, there were the Chips Moment uh, sessions. I, I remember right. those popping. Yeah. Mm. I mean, there's different takes from the Ringo album. I know, and they're not really different, as I recall. Um, they're, no, they're not. Which is they're very slight, right? Which is really, I mean, when you hear stuff like that, you you know, and you end up paying for you end up paying for it, and you you go, wait a minute, this isn't even, you know, this is not that way, you know, not different. What's the point here? They took me for all mm-hmm. this money, and and this is what I got, you know. But oh well, yeah. Anyway, but I do think that that all the the other three Beatles really wrote great material for Ringo. Yeah. So six, um, six o'clock. We're gonna six o'clock is my absolute favorite yeah. of all the songs. I mean, that's that, just yeah, a Beatles beautiful song. And, you know, I, I, I'd yeah. like to hear Paul do that. You know? That would be wonderful. <laughs> Wouldn't it be something if if in concert Paul would just do a whole set of songs he wrote for other people? Mm. You know, there are so many people that would love to to hear him do a world without love, for example. Yeah. You know, yeah. Oh, recently, yeah. recently he did come and get it in Europe, mm-hmm. you know, so and we know he just redid it for this Hollywood vampires uh, um, project. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so let's just move on to the Ringo album, which was by far the most successful of, of his albums. Uh, just an amazing collection of songs. And I think in many ways, um, while so many people attribute the success of that album to the fact that the other three Beatles are on it, you have to take a look at the entire album and all 10 tracks are wonderful, even the ones that didn't have any other Beatle involvement. So um, 
I do think that it was an, a tremendous album, and I think most of us uh, are of the opinion that it is a great album, and for most people, it's it's his best. But uh, he came out all aces with this album. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Alan? Yeah, I think so. Um, and, and things like Six O'Clock uh, really sort of put it over the top. Just looking at, at what else is on it. Um, well, just yeah, for photograph alone. Come on. Yeah, photograph. <laughs> photograph is such a tremendous, a tremendous song and recording. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could do without. Sun- I don't know if say do without sunshine life for me, but that one doesn't isn't that memorable to me uh, as photograph. You're sixteen. Oh my my. Six o'clock. You know. I mean, there's there's so much good stuff on it. It's uh, it's it's. It's just a great album, generally speaking, even if there are a few that, that are, are not as memorable as the others. Um, it just I think it was a big surprise for everyone in a way, especially if you were if you had sort of shrugged them off with Sentimental Journey and Bukoops of Blues. Um, having this album come out just seemed like, OK, you know, maybe we have to pay attention to Ringo, too, you know. Mm-hmm. I have to also mention, have you seen my baby? Because it's Randy Newman. Mm, um, yeah, great, great writer, great song. And, and uh, anyway, but yeah, I mean, it, it it is a great album. I mean, you, I'm looking at the list of tracks here, and I'm just going, good grief, this is just. I mean, people would kill for an album with this many good tracks on it. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he really, Richard Perry did a fantastic job with this. So. Yeah, and You and Me, Babe, is a tremendous song, and, you know, George was heavily involved with that, was co-written with Mel Evans. It's a great album closer. Uh, Devil Woman, which he wrote with Vinnie Poncia, is a really good rocker. I think there's a lot of fans out there that wish he would do that live. Mm -hmm. You know, and like you said, Six O'Clock is is a song of perfection. I mean, it's so tailor-made for Ringo. Paul really, he, he... he gave him his all with that song. And I do love Sunshine Life for me. It's a good hoedown song. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting. You know, the, that's a song where the entire song is written in one chord, mm-hmm. which I don't think is a very easy thing to do. Uh, you know, but uh, it's kind of interesting. And you can really hear George's background vocals in there, too. Mm-hmm. And you should give a lot of credit to the other great musicians that played on this album, especially members of the band. Who are on there? Um, you know, Mark Bolin is on there. It's just, uh, you know, overall, Klaus Vorman, Billy Preston, great musicians throughout the entire album, which is something that became the norm yeah. <laughs> for most of Ringo's albums anyway. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the Ringo album is just a, a total winner, you know. Maybe my impatience with Sunshine Life. Uh... For me, it comes from listening to those <laughs> bootlegs that Steve mentioned because there are a gazillion supposedly different versions of that, which just I think are bare remixes, but but are, are all that's, the same. And that, that's <laughs> true. I, I forgot I forgot about those, but yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, mm. I mean that particular song. I remember, you know, sitting there listening to some of those things and just ew, you know they weren't a lot of fun. It reminds me of the um, the birds put out a big box set of studio sessions and a lot of that was the same thing and it was really disappointing even though the quality was fantastic the there wasn't much to to hear and uh, so it was the same with the springo stuff but anyway all right so let's just move on quickly to goodnight vienna which was also a top 10 album richard perry produced that one as well in my opinion, it's got a lot of great material on there but obviously it wasn't as strong as the ringo album i think uh we may fall into this trap of comparing everything to the Ringo album, yeah. but um, it does have a lot of really good material, especially the title track. I love Ooh Wee, which is a song that he wrote with Vinnie Poncia, has Dr. John doing some really nice uh, piano work. I love Snookaroo, which uh, Elton John and Bernie Taupin gave to Ringo. All By Myself is a really good song. Another one, it's the start of the... The collaborations between Ringo and Goodnight Vienna with Vinnie Poncia, which I found to be very interesting. He was the first major songwriter to work with Ringo, and he did a lot of writing with Ringo throughout the 70s. I love the version of Easy For Me on there, the Harry Nilsson song, which again is kind of like in the good night vein with this heavy orchestration to back up Ringo's vocals, and it really suits him extremely well. And of course, you've got Only You on there. And uh, the No No song, which I think was a surprise hit, <laughs> a novelty record, but you know, it's a fun track overall, catchy tune. You know, I think it was a very solid album. What do you guys think? 
Uh, you know, when it came out, I really didn't like it. I'm not sure why I didn't really, well, I really didn't like it, but for some reason, it, I just had a strong reaction against it. And uh, I, looking at it now and hearing it now, I don't know why, but um, you know, I think it does have some great stuff. I mean, the title song is is really pretty good, um, and you know, let's not forget the No No song, which um, kind of was ironic in a way, but. Um, you know, also seeing him do that on the Smothers Brothers, and um, mm-hmm. it, it's kind of a it's kind of a good song for him, but just yeah. because it's it's kind of comic, you know. And uh, I think it actually holds up better than I obviously had expected it to um, when it first came out. Uh, you know, again, I guess maybe it's the comparison with Ringo, but and and in this case, you know, I think you can't help comparing it with Ringo because it's the album right before it, and it was so strong, and this just didn't seem quite the same or you know quite as strong. Uh, it it seemed almost as if it was an album of you know the outtakes from Ringo or something like that, mm. but uh, I, I like it better now, <laughs> I have to say. I, I think that the one. One thing about it that you have to, you know, that you have to give it credit for is the the um, composers that he used between True. Wade Axton, using using Buck Ram, uh, using Only You, for example, was a, was I mean that's not something you would have expected from Ringo. Good right. Night Vienna, Good Night Vienna is a great great song. It really is, um, you know. And the rest of the album, uh, you know, if you uh, like, you say Alan, you're gonna have, you know, it's gonna get naturally compared to Ringo because it followed Ringo, but it, uh, it didn't do badly in the charts. Um, you know, it, um, trying to look at my, it went to, no, it went to number 10 or number nine, number eight, number eight on, on number eight. Okay. On billboard. So, and it had a, uh, a 25 week run, which is pretty damn good. So whereas Ringo had 37 weeks, good night Vienna had 25, which is not bad. Uh, not bad at all. So it mm-hmm. did it did really well, and I think forever we'll all have the image in our minds of Ringo in the flying saucer on top of the Capitol Tower. Yeah. Um, right. But uh, you know, but uh, it's a great uh, you know it 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 follows in the spirit of Ringo, so it's it's a it's a good follow up. The current CD oh. version does have some help um, in that it, it gets back off Boogaloo and Blind Man and an extended version of Six O'Clock as the bonus tracks. Mm. Right. So it, that kind of that helps, I think. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think that only you was a was that much of a shock that Ringo covered that. I think that Ringo began a pattern of having a cover version, doing some oldie on all of his albums. And so, only you was a it was a song that John suggested that Ringo cover, and the way that it was delivered with that acoustic, more acoustic arrangement really fit him well. Mm-hmm. So, uh, the fact that it was a, a top ten hit in the states, you know, I could just see so many of the other songs that Ringo covered later on to have similar success, but that was not to be. And that's where we'll lead next, <laughs> because. Um, Ringo's Road to Gavura was the album that followed, and that was in 1976. It's going to be tough to go in detail through every single Ringo album here in, in just an hour. But this was the start of a, a real um, dive for Ringo as far as mm-hmm. his record sales are concerned. And I'm kind of baffled by that, because even though I look at the late 70s Ringo stuff from Ringo's Road to Gavure, Ringo the Fourth, and Bad Boy as being, I don't consider them bad albums at all. I think that they're good. They're okay. They all had some good songs. Mm-hmm. But it's not as if you listen to Ringo's Road to Gavure and say that was so much worse than Goodnight Vienna. Yeah. I don't think that the quality necessarily went down. It's just for some reason, all of a sudden, and this carried on throughout the rest of his solo career, he could not pick up steam again you know it didn't matter whether the material was good and um he continued for the most part with having the same kind of formula of having a lot of his friends superstar friends on his albums and in many cases the other beatles but that didn't seem to matter although the bad boy album was a departure in a way because he didn't have a superstar lineup on the songs on on bad boy Mm -hmm. for the songs on that but um 
you know, what made this, this, um, why was there this tailspin all of a sudden with Ringo's career where it just seemed like the public suddenly just quickly lost interest in him? Alan? Um, you know, it may have been something that, yeah, this is off the top of my head, so I could be wrong and, and you will probably be able to um, counter what I'm saying very easily. But it seems to me that we're talking about the mid to late 70s. And I think all of the Beatles were sort of suffering from the fact that music was going in a completely different direction. You know, people were people were not wanting to continue carrying the 60s superstars as, you know, royalty. I mean, John sort of wasn't doing very much anyway by the late 70s. He, you know, he was had that five years off. Paul in the late 70s, uh, well, he was actually he doing okay. He was doing okay. really well. Yeah, he was. <laughs> um, uh, although, you know, after 76, um, I think those things were were less in the public eye than the early uh, up to, say, Wings Over America. And I don't know, it just, uh, just something about, I, 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 I'm, I'm really not sure why, because I'm looking at these track lists and there are songs on all of those albums that I think are fun and, and that I like. And, uh, you know, you can't say that Ringo didn't promote them. You know, he made video clips for most of his singles and then for around the time of Bad Boy, I guess, he did uh, that TV special. Which, you know, wasn't amazing, but it was kind of fun. I don't know if you've watched the outtakes. The outtakes are excruciating. But the show <laughs> <laughs> the show itself, you know, with Art Carney and Carrie Fisher and yeah, it was you know, it wasn't much, but it was fun and and he sang the songs. George was in it too, you know, the that press conference that they had in the show and I don't know why why these things were such failures, but um you know, you, you can't say that he wasn't out there trying to to put them over, and uh, maybe he wasn't performing live, and maybe that was it. I don't know. You realize, but he realize, wasn't. He, he wasn't. He, sorry, go he ahead. wasn't performing live up till then, anyway. Well, it's true. Yeah, it's true. So well, that that would apply to uh, the Ringo album as well. But I don't know. You realize having having Art Carney and Carrie Fisher in that special gives him a link to the Star Wars holiday special. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Um, That's uh, an extreme form of trivia that we're featuring here on the there, show. <laughs> there we, yeah. um, in any event. Um, Maybe but, there's also a little bit of his, um, you know, his, his drinking problems were becoming a little more public. I mean, wasn't it around the time he was doing these that he went on John Davidson completely crocked, you know, did, mm -hmm. did some of those public interviews like not in the best shape? You know, although, frankly, I don't think people don't buy records because the person who made him gets drunk. You know, it, I, I think those are two separate things. And, yeah. Um, if that's the case, you'd have had a lot of people's. Records. Not so, selling records, <laughs> right? Right, yeah. And that didn't that didn't happen. Mm. So you know, in in so many cases, and I can apply this to the other Beatles and and what records they released at a certain time. But you could have taken any Ringo album that followed uh, the Ringo album, and instead of it being Goodnight Vienna, it was Ringo's Road to Gavure. It was Stop and Smell the Roses. It was Time Takes Time, which I think is is one of his best. And if those albums had come out in 1974, they would have been just as successful as Goodnight Vienna. It's not like there's that big a difference in the quality of the music, yeah. the way that I see it, because they all had good songs. They all had singles that could have gone somewhere. But for some reason, radio decided not to play them. Although a, d a dose of rock and roll did make the top 40, it went to number 26. Yeah. And I thought that song could have done much better than it did. So I just don't really understand when it comes to this this real dive in Ringo's career, what was the difference in the quality of the music? I guess what I was trying to say is that the rest of the world was sort of hurtling towards disco in those days. And, and, and a guy coming out and singing songs as he has always come out and sung songs probably was less interesting to radio. You know, he was singing mm. in that style that people from the 60s did, you know, actual songs. <laughs> Right. No ridiculous you know, disco beat. <laughs> let's know. not get into a big argument over disco because I happen to like disco. But uh, no, 
Yes, it's uh, I'm just, I was I was not uh, you know someone who went to Studio Fifty Four, but uh, I did like a lot of the crossover stuff that was on the pop charts. And uh, you know, Saturday Night Fever was the album that dominated the the album charts when London oh, Town yes. came out, which is why it didn't make number one, but it still made number two. So I think that you know Paul was not really suffering the rest of the seventies. Although Back to the Egg did uh, it only made like number eight on the charts. So, um, but that could also be because yep. Good Night Tonight was not on there. So. Um, you know, I don't think Paul was suffering. I don't think uh, there were a lot of rock stars that tried to adapt to the changes and put out their own dance records or disco records like the Rolling Stones, which we mentioned, like Rod Stewart with Do You Think I'm Sexy, something like that. But at the same time, there was still pop stuff that was selling really well. You didn't have to. You know, you had a group like the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac, and they didn't have to rely on disco. You know, you had people who put out pop and rock, and they did fine. So Ringo still put out, you know, more of the same stuff. I think when um, when he released Drowning in the Sea of Love, which was kind of like a dance track, uh, kind of in the disco style, that was him trying to fit in there. And I don't think that particular arrangement worked for him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But at mm. the same time, you know, most of his albums had songs that you could say, wow, that's a single. You know, if... if um, if the No No song could be a hit, then certainly "Hard on My Sleeve" from Bad Boy could have been a hit. Yeah, you know that was that was a great song. I like to that me. song. It's, yeah. one of, it's one of my favorites of all of Ringo's solo songs, and I think that really suited his style and his persona. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, there's a lot of songs on the Bad Boy album that I could have seen as singles that could have worked just as well as the hits that he had in '73 and '74. So I just fail to see what the difference is in the quality and, and why suddenly it just completely changed. Was Ringo looked upon as being more of a novelty? You know, the Beatle that you wouldn't expect to have hits, but but he did. Maybe he relied too much on his friendship with the other Beatles or other people. Is that what carried him over with those hits? Or is it really because of the fact that those hits were strong songs? Which is what I believe, ultimately. But maybe the public's perception of him was different. Hmm. Because, you know, he, he has never gotten that much respect overall, maybe in recent years, especially since we're noticing that, you know, the public might be noticing more what a great drummer he is and what his contribution was in the Beatles. But, you know, he was always looked upon as being one of the luckiest musicians on the face of the earth, and maybe that carried over into why his records didn't sell after Goodnight Vienna and why radio basically refused to play him. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you have any any ideas about that? No, you're probably right. I, we should probably head on to Stop and Smell the Roses, which I believe did I didn't I pick that as my uh, Ringo album that I would possibly take to a desert island. I remember you guys uh, being shocked at it, whatever my choice was, and I think that might have been it. Okay. You know those those next two, Stop and Smell the Roses and an Old Wave. He could hardly get those things released. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, I think Old Wave was released in Canada and Germany initially, and that was mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So, you know, and again, they're 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 really not bad. I mean, I like Rack My Brain. Uh, he did a remake of Back Off Boogaloo. Stop it was and, really like a medley where he worked in Beatles songs. And Stop and Take the, the Titles of Beatles songs. Yeah, Stop yeah. and Take the Time to Smell the Roses, I, I thought was a, a, a nice track, and they had a good video for it. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I think, wasn't that album also, he was working on that when John was shot, and he sort of put it aside because John had sent some songs for it, like Life Begins at 40. Uh, yeah, and he... it was going to be called "Can Fight Lightning" originally. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, John was going to give him "Life Begins at 40 and uh, apparently nobody told me was going to be given to Ringo. Ah, uh, yeah, and it's got drumming is my madness and yeah, rack my <laughs> brain, attention. You know, he made the, he made a series of videos with Paul and Linda for some of these, like a, a, a little a little sort of short film that had a few of the songs yeah, the... in it. The cooler, yeah, it was called. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, I don't know. Again, you know, we, we we could say for for some of these albums the, the same thing we've been saying for the last few. You know, why didn't anybody pay attention? I don't know. Well, I think I think probably the, uh, a good reason would be the label. I think uh, you know for, they had it buried on. Uh, I mean, they, they it just didn't get distributed 
as well as it should have. And I think that's probably a good reason for it. And then when Capital reissued it, they put it on the right stuff, which is really kind of silly because, you know, who's going to know who's going to know about it then? At least they put it out again, though. So but um, it's just uh, yeah, I, I, I the distribution, I think, is it had was a lot of the problem with that album. So I know it was with Old Wave, yeah, like you said, yeah. Alan, because it, it didn't get released here for a long time. In fact, I believe it showed up on bootleg before it before it came out here, which wouldn't you know, which is not surprising. So I mean that's that's criminal almost that that they didn't put it out here. That's really silly. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I remember seeing it as an import. I used to work at a record store at the time, and that was the only way to get it then. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, th- those two albums are really very strong albums too. I agree with you a lot, Alan, about Stop and Smell the Roses, because not only are there the songs that you mentioned, I think Paul's work with Ringo on that album is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. You know, Attention is a great, catchy song, and Private Property, I think, was a really good lead-off track. And um, a lot of people point to Short of Fall as a favorite, because it takes you back to the Mm -hmm. Beatles recording that song, and, uh, you know, another one in the country vein, the Carl Perkins song. Right. And... um, Apart from that, you know, he works so well with Harry Nilsson. Stop and Take the Time to Smell the Roses and Drumming as My Madness are both kind of like novelty-esque, mm-hmm. same way that the No-No song was. Mm-hmm. And I do like especially some of the songs that people overlook on that album because Nice Way, which was uh, partly written by Stephen Stills, was a, a really good song. And um, Ringo co-wrote a song with Ron Wood on there called Dead Giveaway, which I thought was pretty good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, And I also think that with Old Wave, and it's not because Joe Walsh is his brother-in-law. I think there's a real... I just think the two of them work so well together. They fit rather nicely, stylistically, yeah. in terms of the songwriting and in terms of jo- uh, Joe Walsh's guitar work. I just think that they... I love the songs that Ringo writes with Joe Walsh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it started with that album. That's right. You know? So go back to that one. Right. And Joe Walsh has co-written you know, a song here and there on Ringo's more recent albums. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's it's a really good... The two of them are just a, a good pair, mm-hmm. Ringo with Joe Walsh. Right. Yeah. Of course, he wasn't right, his brother-in-law so... at the time. But... <laughs> no, I know. But uh, since it seems like we're just going through the discography, let's go to uh, Time Takes Time, 1992. Which was, which was really his, his renaissance. It was his... Reju- uh, it really revived him. Yeah. Revived his career a lot. It really did. It was, it was a great album, and I think it surprised everybody because nobody was expecting anything. And you know, it started off with "Way to the World" and "Don't Go Where the Road Don't Go." Even now, sounds fantastic. And I, he's actually he's done that. I, I think I heard him do that once live. He hasn't done it very often, but he did do it live at one of the shows I went to, and uh, it's fantastic. Uh, so, That's a great live song, and mm-hmm. he's done it on several of his tours, but yeah, he hasn't done that one for a long time now. Yeah. But, you know, when, when he started his All-Star Band tours, he did that one on the first few. Right. And he brought it back later. I think he's very proud of that particular song. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that was, you know, his message at the time. I mean, we 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 should point out, everyone probably knows it, but um, that Time Takes Time was really the first thing he did after getting sober, and he was almost... Not, not militant about it, or not even the way Paul is about not eating meat, but he was, you know, he was sort of on message there. I mean, he said in his interviews, you know, I had this problem, I took care of it, and don't go where the road don't go is sort of what that's about, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I think there were other things too, uh, you know, and he was trying to deal with topical things like runaways, and, um, you know, he'd be sort of like like John in the old days, inspired by something he saw in the news, you know. But, yeah, a lot of good stuff on that album, and it's well played, and it's well sung, and I think, um, you know, Steve's right, it was sort of a rebirth for him, you know. And he also had a story to sell, too, about, you know, getting sober and everything, right. and going out on the road. So, you know, he sort of had it all at that point. Yeah, I really think that Time Takes Time was such a turning point in Ringo's career because ever since that album's come out, I really have sensed that Ringo puts full effort behind 
all of his albums. Mm -hmm. You know, you might think that some of his late 70s stuff, although, I, as I said, I think that they're good, solid albums, you might think that, you know, there might be a, a, you know, a song here and there that wasn't that strong. Maybe he didn't give it his all. Yeah. Maybe he was just doing it because, mm -hmm. well, I got to make another album. This is my album for next year. But I think that with every album that he's released from Time Takes Time On, he's really put the effort in. Yeah, I think, I think and I think a, it shows. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I think that's I think that's true. Uh, I think you really can hear the difference between those '70s albums and and Time Takes Time a lot. There's a, a quite a change there. Uh, quite a the thing about Go yeah, ahead. with Time Takes Time. Kind of like the Ringo album, which had 10 songs, and Time Takes Time also has 10 songs. It's another album that I think is a perfect album because I love every song on it. And despite the fact that you have four different producers on there, uh, with the exception of Jeff Lynne, who has such a really distinctive production style, you really can't tell whether it's Don Was, who produced the track, or uh, Peter Asher, who produced it, uh, or Phil Ramone. You know? And um, there's a real consistency throughout. There's so many songs on there that... Had it been 1974, the follow-up to, to Ringo could have been big hits. And I often point to In a Heartbeat as being one of the greatest singles that never were. Because it's, uh, it's really a tremendous song, which was written by Diane Warren, who is one of the most successful female songwriters from like the 90s on up. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a tremendous song that would have made a great pop hit in the 70s for Ringo. You know, I just don't see if that was the follow up to photograph, that would have been a number one single, mm -hmm. <laughs> just like your 16 was. And just, uh, you know, every song on there is a winner. Way to the World is one of the best songs he's ever done, mm -hmm. I think, in his solo career. It's just so tailor made for him. And I love the 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 guitar sound. It's it's very 60s ish. And you can tell that with a song like I Don't Believe You, uh, that was definitely made to capture the the 65 Ringo sound. So yeah, every song on there is a winner, and uh, I definitely consider it like in my top three of Ringo albums. So um, and you definitely and you get an obscure B side as well that's worth getting, which is his version of "Don't Be Cruel," it was on the right. of "Weight of the World," and which I is fun to listen to. It was probably a CD single, just but <laughs> <laughs> we've actually come up to an hour now already. And uh, we've gone through like half of his catalog, <laughs> and we haven't talked about the rest of his career, Let's, the movies. I well, so, I was, uh, I was going to say we should at least have a brief mention of Vertical Man, which really, on top of the success of Time Takes Time, really made everything blossom even that much better, and really cemented you know what laid the foundation for what. Uh, what he's doing now and how good how good things are now um i mean it, it, we can stop there but i just i think that should be mentioned is that uh, a lot of people look at vertical man now as is really such an incredible i think there are some people that actually compare vertical man with ringo in terms of how good those two albums are and they really are it really they really are great they both are at least uh, at least i think so you guys think hmm. Well, I, I look at the, the Mark Hudson period, those first three albums, Vertical Man, Ringo Rama, and Choose Love, as being all pretty equal. Mm -hmm. I think they're all solid albums. And I think that, um, you know, whereas Vinnie Poncia was the, the big songwriting partner for Ringo in the 70s, and Ringo did a little bit of songwriting here and there with other people, especially with Joe Walsh, Mark Hudson became his guy, mm -hmm. really, once that album once Vertical Man, once they started working on that, and then the albums that followed, and also Liverpool 8, and the Christmas album, I Want to Be Santa Claus, which was an amazing album to me. But I think that, you know, the collaboration between Ringo and Mark Hudson, that really got him interested even more in the songwriting aspect to the point where just about every single song on his albums, now he, he co-writes. So that's a whole other world now of Ringo, where he did it before, but not to this level, you know, where just about every single song is a co-write, which is part of, you know, one of the great successes of Ringo's solo career. He got to songwriting kind of late. He blossomed kind of late, but he got there. Mm -hmm. And it took all these other people to get him there. And I think the combination of Ringo and Mark Hudson was one of the best things that ever happened in his career. And also the other people in the Roundheads that work with him, like Gary Burr and Steve Dudas, and, uh, you know, those songs are the songs on those albums 
I won't say that with Liverpool 8 because that's um, not as consistently strong as the others, but there are some good songs on Liverpool 8. But, um, you know, the, that collaboration, having those people to work with on those albums in a row, it began to feel like more of a band effort, even though they had other musicians helping out besides the Roundheads, but it felt more and more like a band. And I think Ringo was getting into a, a really good groove with those musicians on every level um, in terms of the songs that were put on those albums, his songwriting, the production behind it, and really making a concerted effort that just about every single song on those albums were really strong and very interesting. If there's one thing that I think he should do, that I think everybody wishes he would do is to go back to a Ringo and the Roundheads kind of format or issue or, I mean, or band or, you know, redo ring, bring back Ringo and the Roundheads at least once, Uh because I think that was a great, that was a great period. And he, he, I, I don't know whether it's, you know, whether he just doesn't feel like he wants to at his, at his age at 75, want to take that much of a spotlight, but it was, it was, uh, that Ringo and the Roundheads tour was fantastic. And it's too bad that we can't have that anymore. Uh, cause that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, I mean, he takes a lot of the spotlight with the all-star band. Of course he has to, but it'd be sure nice to have Ringo and the Roundheads again. Cause that was really, although, you know, everybody says all the all-stars are a band. The Roundheads were a band. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that you say that though, Steve, because when postcards from paradise came out and you were saying you kind of prefer Ringo's album since the Roundheads, you like his production more, you know, moving That's, away you got, from our hell of a memory here. Jeez. <laughs> well, I, you're going to use this, you're gonna use this <laughs> for me. Use this against me now. But yeah. I mean, no, I'm, just, I'm but... just saying, I'm just saying, I think the, the Ringo was around. I mean, I'm not the only one that feels like that. There, you know, there were, I remember hearing a lot of comments about Ringo and the Roundheads, and people were saying they like partially because those shows were all Ringo. So he wasn't mm-hmm. he wasn't you know giving off the uh, the spotlight to somebody else every two minutes, you know those shows were all Ringo and I think that's one thing and so he was forced to do a whole set list of his songs, mm-hmm. uh, and I think that's I mean that's part of the that's part of the motivation for saying that. So what what you're really saying to clarify is that you kind of wish that Ringo would do shows live performances with the Roundheads as opposed to making new albums. Studio albums. Yeah. Okay. I'll 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 go with that. I mean, but sure. I I think another uh, depending on the band too. I mean, I don't know who who he would pick up at this point in time. I mean, I can imagine that just about anybody would be glad to work for him, work with him. But uh, yeah, I'd be. I think it'd be nice to have, you know, uh, an alternate band. I've also often wanted him to do drum projects. You know, either uh, I and one of the and I've said this before, one of the high points of the exhibit at the Grammy Museum in L.A. was him giving drum drumming lessons because it was great because you saw you saw his technique right naked. And I I wish he would do kind of like what Bill um, Kreutzmann has done uh, with the dead, where he's done these solo, pro, you know, vanity projects. I wish he would kind of do something like that, that the, what the. um closest thing i think he's done was that um that video lesson the indian drumming lesson with i can't even remember her name now where he she was teaching him how to play the tabla and that was just fantastic to watch him you know pick that up and i, I would love to be able to see more of him drumming like that um hmm. i think every i think everybody would okay alan any final comments about what we've been talking about uh, no, I, I I agree with what you guys are saying, and, and it's a pity we uh, aren't getting to the second half of the discography. Although we did uh, <laughs> a whole show on on his most recent album, so um, I also you know I also went through a period of wishing that he would tour with the Roundheads and do full shows as the front man, and um, I think I might have suggested that once in a review of I'm not sure what maybe it was Choose Love or something, and uh, it was when David Fishoff was still managing him, and he <laughs> he did a um, 
he did a concert at the bottom line in New York. Right. And uh-huh. I was there. David Fishoff came up to me and, and said, uh, yeah, so uh, Ringo read your review. And I said, oh, really? And what did he say? And he said, he wants me to go on tour with these roundhead guys. Tell them to forget it. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I mean, I just felt that. I mean, I like the, I like the all-stars, but I thought with the roundheads, it was, you know, guys you're working with on the records, guys you're working with who are, you know, just a, a, a tighter, we're in it to, to, you know, be your band ensemble. And I also, you know, I was lucky to get to see the roundheads several times, um, you know, I guess all at the bottom line, you know, small venues and, you know, those were good shows. You know, I think, Mm -hmm. I think he just didn't want to be the front man for a whole show. Those were also short shows. Right. But, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of wish he had, but you know, the, the all-star format is pretty good too. We didn't actually touch on that. Um, and if we had, I would probably um, observe that at this point, he's probably putting out way too many live records. <laughs> you know, most every time the, the all-stars go out, except recently, you know, just looking through the discography here, there's like so many all-star band records. And mm-hmm. right. his parts of them are largely the same, you know. I mean, there's always going to be a little help for my friends in Yellow Submarine and Don't Come Easy. And uh, so that gets a little bit repetitive, especially if, like me, you feel compelled to buy everything that they do. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I wish he would do studio things more frequently and um, live albums less frequently. But actually looking mm. at it now uh, – yeah, we got two studio albums in a row, 2012 and Postcards from Paradise. And then before that was Live at the Greek Theater. And then before that, two albums, two studio albums. And before that, Soundstage. And then before that, Ringo and the All-Star Band. So maybe I'm complaining to no purpose. <laughs> It used to be, though. I mean, it used to be in the 60s, you know, you'd have a group that would put out 12 albums and one of them would be a, a, a live album, you know. And now it's OK, you know, having two studio albums in a row and then a live album. Well, it's better than the Rolling Stones are doing. The mm-hmm. Rolling Stones are all live or compilations. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how to look at the whole live aspect as far as the CDs that have come out and DVDs. To me... Ringo in concert with the All Stars is is an event, and mm-hmm. it's more to watch, right? As well, and you know, and I love the music itself, obviously. And in so many cases, if you put on uh, a live CD from tour number two uh, versus tour number six, you're not going to be able to tell which version of it don't come easy, right? It is that you're hearing that they're all kind of the same. The only difference is what the other All Star musicians are, and which ones are in each band, and the material that they're doing. And yes, Ringo's material has changed somewhat from tour to tour. He still does the staples all the time. But I do think that the DVDs that have come out are wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's something that I spend more time uh, as far as his live performances, you know, watching the DVDs as opposed to listening to the CDs. But who knows? It's nice to have a document of everything. Yeah. (laughs) You know, someday when they're all no longer with us, it's nice to have something to represent each tour. And actually, he hasn't put out something for every tour. Right. But um, it's nice that he has put out quite a lot. And I guess so uh, so long as I'm getting the bootlegs anyway, the least I could do is buy one of his official ones for each tour. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There is that uh, 1989 video, which apparently has been picked up uh, by a lot of overseas uh, distributors that you can pick up for maybe about 10 bucks on Amazon that is well worth, I mean, that's the first tour and that's well worth grabbing if you don't have it. Um, I think he had still had the ponytail at the time, which absolutely, which looking back on those days was, he looked horrible in that thing, but, but uh, the music was great. No, no question about it. So, well, when you watch when you watch DVDs of these tours, or even if you want to go on YouTube and watch any of this stuff, mm-hmm. it's amazing the talent that he's had in the last twenty six years. All the all right. amazing people that have been in his bands, and it's just um, it's fascinating to watch all this stuff and to look at these people through the years, and especially when they were younger, many of whom are no longer with us. Right. And you know, it's it's uh, I I look at these tours as being very historic. You know, different combinations of various people and 
interesting combinations at times. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, you know, I still point to that tour that had uh, Roger Hodgson and Sheila E. and Ian Hunter and Howard Jones and, uh, you know, thinking to myself, how could this ever work? And it's amazing, you know, how it how everything just seems to gel, you know, it, you, going from in the court of the Crimson King to uh, the glamorous life from Sheila E. Right, right. And it's wonderful. And it's just an amazing thing. The, you know, the range of music that it's presented in all these tours. And uh, I'm so grateful that Ringo's done so many of them and still continues to. I but yeah, I would like. I would like to see something similar to a Roundhead tour. I always wanted to, to see that. He did play, he never did a tour with them, but he did play some sporadic shows, and one of them that I got to see was at Irving Plaza in New York City. Mm-hmm. And the thing about those shows, like you were saying, Alan, they're much shorter. They were like an hour and ten minutes. And they were basically the same songs that he does with the All-Stars with a couple of other songs that he threw in. It's not like he really reached deep into his catalog and pulled out a lot of stuff that he would only do with the Roundheads. So um, I'd love to see like something close to a two-hour show that would be basically all Ringo songs mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and go deeper into his catalog. You know, I, I, you know, he's done just about all. He's done every Beatles song except Goodnight. So, uh, you know, as far as solo material, there's, it's endless what he could do. Right. And, uh, yeah, I'd love to see him do that and, and um, you know, show pride in his solo catalog and um but he loves the whole aspect of the all-stars it puts him in a comfort zone he loves drumming behind all these different people that he admires he doesn't just want to be up front singing and he can't drum and sing on every single song at this you know throughout an entire show so um i think that it's a safe it's a much safer presentation for ringo to have all these other stars because you know some of the fans who go out there go to see the other people just as much as they go to see Ringo. Many of them go to see mainly Ringo, but some of them go to see the others too. So uh, it's a great concept. It's a formula that has worked all these years and still continues to work, so I'm glad he's still doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But at some point, we really should you know, revisit you know, the rest of uh, Ringo's solo career because we could go deeper from, say, Vertical Man on mm-hmm. and also talk about his movies too. If you want to go that far, oh, sure. well, just or do tell, one show on his just, movies, so just, just tell let's everybody. not talk about movies now. <laughs> right, I was going to say let's just tell everybody to demand that we do it. You know, everybody out there listening, just send us an, uh, an email to things we said today radio show at gmail dot com and demand we talk more about Ringo. <laughs> and I'm sure that we're going to get a flood of emails from people saying that Sextet deserves one full show. There so we go. when that <laughs> when that happens, you know, and candy. You all know about it. That's mm-hmm. actually we could we should do a Ringo movie show. We really should because besides that particular movie, I mean, he's done the the movies are just, are uh, in a class by themselves. They really are, you know. So mm. there we go. All right. So <laughs> anybody want to add anything at all or plug anything? Mm-mm. Well, I, I, let me just mention since it was announced today that he's doing a. Ringo's doing a live on-stage interview for those of you in the LA area on the 25th uh, at the El Rey Theater. Uh, El, 25th of September at the El Rey Theater in Los Angeles. It was just announced this morning. The tickets are on sale through access. AXS.com, and I don't know how much they are. And I'm told. Um, somebody asked me this morning whether or not the event would be streamed. There are no plans to stream it now, but the, but that is an open question. It's not been decided. It 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 could happen. So anyway, there you go. And you should say this is being done to promote his new book, right? It, it, called Photograph. We also were going to get into. We were also going to talk about the books, but but we ended up talking about the album and uh, albums and didn't get that far. But yeah, they're reissuing. The photograph book, actually, for they're issuing it for the third time, because the first time it was out as an ebook, then they put the signed book, and then they and now this is the book without the the Genesis. This is the Undelux Genesis ver uh, Undelux Genesis version, because Genesis is this a, is I believe is doing it. Yeah, this is mass market, right? So anybody can buy it. So kind of like when um, I Me Mine came out as a book in mass market. This is sort of the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So there we go. All right. This has been fun talking about Ringo, quite a lot of his 
discography here, and we'll hopefully finish the rest of it at some point in the future and talk about other aspects of Ringo's solo career, like his movies. So, on behalf of Steve Marinucci, Alan Cozen, in absentia, Al Sussman, and myself, Ken Michaels, Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.